Good morning. I want to send greetings to the people of the District of Columbia and to my colleagues. I'm Council Member Jim Graham, Chairperson of the Committee on Human Services. The time is now 25 minutes to, 12, uh, to 11 on Thursday, May 15, 2014, and I call to order this additional meeting of the, of the Human Services Committee. Uh, I recognize the presence of a quorum with all members of the committee here. Uh, to my right is Council, at large Council Member Anita Barnes, and then uh, Ward 8 Council Member Marion Barry, Ward 6 Council Member Tommy Wells, and Ward 5 Council Member Kelvin McDuffie, Kenyon McDuffie. Uh, we are here in room 500 of the historic John A. Wilson building at 1350 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest to consider and vote on the mayor's proposed FY 2015 operating and capital budgets for the agencies under the committee's oversight. Additionally, we will vote on proposed budget request act, the mayor's proposed budget support act, and the mayor's recommended uh, BSA budget support act titles. Now, I, I'm going to try to st keep this statement, which is longer than I'm going to have, actually, <laughs> but I'm to the highlights of this report. Uh, I want to thank Council Member Bowser for a total transfer of $2 million from the Committee on Economic Development. Of that total, $1.5 million will be used for rapid rehousing pilot program for individuals who are homeless. $500,000 will be used to expand the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which helps low-income residents facing housing emergencies. I want to note that in the circulated committee report, the funding was allocated for 10 additional case management positions at DC General. However, because the funding is not reoccurring, this is one time only funding, uh, Council Member Bowser and I agreed that the best use would be the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. I also want to thank Council Member Mary Che for the transfer of $1.3 million from the Committee on Public Works, Transportation, and the Environment, which will be used to enhance the, the nutritional assistance program, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or SNAP, we, we know that more commonly as food stamps. Uh, we're still working with the Budget Office and the Chief Financial Officer to determine the, the exact amount of the enhancement. For the Children's Youth Investment Trust Corporation, the Department of Disability Services, and the Office of Disability Rights, I recommend approval of the Mayor's proposed FY15 operating budget with no changes. The proposed budget includes no proposed capital budget for any of these agencies. So for CYITC, that would be a level funding of $3 million. For DDS, it would be $158,051,133, which represents a 65% increase over its FY 2014 approved budget. This is, this is uh, their, their budget is comprised mostly of local funds. The committee notes that there appears to be an increase in the 15 budget for DDS uh, of 65 percent, but this results from a transfer. This results from a transfer of local funding from the Home and Community Based Services Waiver from the Department of Mental Health Care Finance, Department of Health Care Finance to DDS to ensure transparency with respect to the use of the funds to serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So in fact, the DDS, the Department of Disability Services, has but a very small increase. Uh, <clears throat> now, the proposed budget of one million is, now this is for the proposed gross budget. Whoops, I think I missed a page here. I now move approval, and I think we're going to hold all these motions to the end. Can we do that? Okay. Now, the CFSA, Child, Child Family Services Administration, Agency proposed by FY15 budget is 249 million 213,000, which represents just under 5% increase over its FY 2014 approved gross budget. The budget is comprised of 171 million dollars in local funds. There is no FY15 capital budget for CFSA. So the committee recommends the following changes to the CFSA operating budget. Transfer $1 million from CFSA to the Department of Human Services to support the End Youth Homelessness Reform Amendment Act of 2014. This is a new BSA subtitle that will receive a separate discussion and vote. In addition, $1.8 million transferred from CFSA to the Department of Human Services to be used to expand eligibility for the POWER program. And this is the exemption from TANF cuts. 
uh, to include a single custodial parent or caretaker with a child under the age of 12 months. This also is the subject of a new BSA subtitle. Transfer $50,000 from CFSA to the Department of Human Services to replace federal funds lost from a grant for family violence prevention. Transfer $96,000 from CFSA to the Committee on Business and Consumer and Regulatory Affairs to add one FTE at the Office of the Attendant Advocate. This is unusual, but I'm so compelled. I was the author of the Office of the Attendant Advocate when it was first established. It is a very important office to help tenants you know, uh, secure and recognize and, and exercise their rights as tenants under D.C. law. It's a very important position, a very important office, and this position will enhance it. It's rare, though, for this committee to transfer funds to another committee, but in this case, I think it's fully warranted. This person will, rep will be a lawyer who will represent tenant associations in simple and complex administrative actions, provide uh, legal advice to tenants, draft legal briefs and motions and other documents, speak before tenant associations and other groups, and prepare and review tenant educational materials, and so on. Uh, so that is one transfer from CFSA to the Department of, to the Committee of uh, Business and Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, but to the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. The Department of Human Services, now this is the key agency this is the key agency for homelessness, poverty, TANF, uh, and this is, a, this is a, a very important part of this budget. Uh, the proposed FY15 gross budget is for $408,120,000, which represents about a 4.2 increase over its FY2014 level. The budget is comprised of $224 million in local funds, and the balance is federal. The committee is recommending the following changes to the DHS operating budget. Direct $5.8 million internal DHS transfer from the TANF employment vendors proposed funding allocation to eliminate a 41.7% TANF reduction for those who have been on TANF for 60 months. This reduction is currently set to take effect on October 1st, 2014. This is a new BSA title that will have a separate discussion and vote. But if we don't act to do this on October the 1st, uh, of 2014, uh, TANF recipients who've been on the program for more than 60 months will experience a 41% cut in their benefits. I think it's important to recognize that while we have good programs in place that are working better and better, that we have not yet solved the issues of moving TANF recipients, long-term welfare re recipients, from welfare dependency to self-sufficiency. Another year, I think, will make a substantial difference, and we'll be able to consider something along that line at that time. Or well, you all will be able to consider it. I won't be here for that particular issue or any other. Direct an $800,000 internal DHS transfer from funding allocated to support a TANF time-limited exemption for parents or caretakers who are enrolled in an education or training program. This was something, this TANF exemption we passed last year. But the DHS was unable to implement it because we didn't provide enough money, as it turned out. We thought we provided enough money, but they said we didn't. And so uh, even though we were assured at the time, so we're going to transfer those unspent dollars in addition to $1.8 million transferred from CFSA to exempt a parent or caretaker with a child under the age of 12 months from having TANF cuts or being subject to the during the period of the exemption of being subject to the uh, that time being used as part of the 60 months. We're also directing $550,000 to take from vacancy savings from DHS to fund a CCMB feasibility and assessments to survey and study. Now I have been meeting pursuant to DC law that this council passed with stakeholders at CCMB which is the largest shelter in the District of Columbia for a period of now seven months. And this, will, we, we're coming up with our recommendations soon for the council. We'll be having a hearing. But this will ensure the momentum that we've created by this task force will be continued into FY 2015. Again, there'll be a new BSA subtitle on that. The mayor's FY 2015 capital budget for DHS is 18,337,000 over six fiscal years. 15 million of it will be in FY 2015. The FY 2015 allotment reflects funding to replace the 20-year-old 
public benefit eligibility system with an integrated health and human, human services case management system, the DC access system it will be called, DCAS. DHS is also ex uh, accepting several transfers from CFSA, the Committee on, Develop on Transportation and the Environment, and the Committee on Economic Development, all of which I've already discussed. Now we go to the DYS. The Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services uh, plays a critical role in terms of juvenile justice and the rehabilitation of juvenile offenders. The proposed budget for FY 2015 is $109 million, which represents a 4.2% increase over its FY 2014 approved gross budget. The budget is comprised of $109 million in local funds. There is no capital budget for DYRS. The committee is recommending the following change to the DYRS operating budget. Transfer, and I should have said this, and maybe I'll say it later on, I'm not sure. But in both the case of DYRS, and CFSA, DYS in terms of youthful offenders, CFSA in terms of foster care, their caseloads are plummeting. That's good news. There are fewer and fewer people coming into the system. And so that provides the opportunity for us to spend our dollars more wisely in terms of quality programming for those who are entering as well as those who are already there. But it does reduce, in my opinion, the need for quite as large amount of funding. Uh, for FY15. So we propose to transfer $3 million from DYRS to the Department of Human Services for permanent supportive, homeless, permanent supportive housing for homeless families. And I want to note that I'm still working with the Council's Budget Office and the CFO to determine what amount, if any, can be certified for the D, from DYRS for the purpose of D, PSH. But we're having those discussions right now. Right this minute. <laughs> Not right this minute. But we want to be clear. That we, we do not believe that the CFO has a legislative role. They have issues relating to, you know, is there enough money? Are you going to put the budget out of balance? Are these funds properly being spent in terms of categories? But in terms of the decision of where to transfer monies from who to what, that's a legislative priority along with the mayor. And I, I had a conversation last night with the chief, our new chief financial officer, and he agreed with me that that was not the province of the CFO to interfere with. A footnote. Now we turn to to the budget support subtitles. Okay, so we have completed our consideration of the Budget Request Act provisions, and I will now move for the committee to accept this recommendation on the various provisions relating to the Budget Request Act. Is there is there discussion? Discussion. Mr. Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a, quite a bit of discussion, but I'm going to limit some of it. I think what, we, what this committee has succeeded in doing is changing the way people look at low-income uh, clients. That we are very definitely pushing but reality are moving from dependency to self-sufficiency. These are idle words right now. Because when you look at the program, you don't find that happening. Give an example. Well, the, the data I've seen with the people who have been employed from TANF into the private sector, they have been minimum wage jobs. Minimum wage jobs. There is no way you can be self-sufficient with a minimum wage job. Even though you may continue subsidy of Medicaid, food stamps, and housing, there is no way you can begin to be self-sufficient. So, Mr. Graham, what I want to do for the rest of this year is to work as hard as we can to put some concrete things on the table that will ensure that that happens. For instance, I talked with the Hotel Association, Thomas Penny. I've talked with the union. And the union has gotten these chambermaids up to $34,000, $36,000 a year. Just making up beds and things. Got good health benefits. Got good okay. retirement benefits. And I often ask the question, 
Why can't some of these kind of mothers be trained? They must train to be done and get the hotels in this town, over 100 hotels, to agree to start hiring these kind of people at those kind of benefits. That's real self-determination and self-sufficiency. If you're making 34, 35,000, you're not enough to live in the district, but it certainly is a far more quiet than what we, we've had. And so we, we in a dilemma here, and I take my share of responsibility. In 1995, when the national government reformed welfare system, put a cap of 60 months on it. And I was mayor at that time, my fourth term, and I slept it in the sense that we continued to fund our local program, our local monies, which perpetuated this cycle. Where we got eight or 9,000 people who've been on the road more than 60 months. And I take full responsibility for, for sleeping that vision. But since that time, Ms. Alexander and I uh, raised the question of uh, the 60 months. And, and we found, Mr. Cameron, that there were eight, 9,000 people over there. Had been no, uh, no, uh, uh, no assessment of what they could do, could not do. It was just a total mess. And so what the committee has done is try to find a way to be humane at the same time be effective. And you've said this many times, Mr. Chairman, if we cut TANF benefits, it affects about 11,000 young people under the age of 13. And we know what's going to happen. These parents, most of them anyway, they're not going to cut out what they've been spending money on. They're going to cut it off the children's money. So you're going to have children who are victims of, of a abrupt cut. And that's why I'm so glad that you and I and the other members of the committee have worked awfully hard to get the $6 million to keep people from being cut. See, all this has a ripple effect. We cut their benefits, it's going to affect their income, it's going to affect housing, probably. It may put more people into emergency shelters, and it just keeps rippling, rippling. Instead, what we've tried to do, not been but so successful, is get the department to train people for real jobs, for upper mobility jobs, for careers, et cetera. So I would suggest that we just, between now and January 1st, this committee just dig in on trying to make this a reality. I talked to a number of TANF recipients. Uh, my southeast office is located, one of our service centers, 2100 Martin Luther King. And the great majority of them have just come to believe that this is how you got, you got to live. There's no other hope, Tommy, no other way to go. We were stuck in this bind. Might as well just accept that. Now, I don't agree with that. You know, I don't agree with that. But it takes some time because a number of these welfare recipients, TANF recipients, are generational. Uh, their mothers were on, at that time, welfare. Their grandmothers were on it. Their cousins were on it. And it's become just a dependency that national government, local government, has put on these people. The great majority of people really don't want to work. But they've been beat down so, so many times, and they just give up. Now, I don't agree that they'll be giving up, but they do. And so I support you very much so in this TANF uh, cut. I talked with the mayor about this. He, he just had a different point of view. He has a good heart, but he thinks the way you... You, you get them off of TANF is to cut the benefits 
and then try to make them, in, in a sense, go out to the training programs and get a job. So I point out to the mayor, and I'm a supporter of Mayor, mayor, mayor Gray, that the private sector is not hiring these TANF recipients. Uh, some quarters will, but not massively enough. And so I'm going to go on record with that. Now, in terms of homeless, disconnected youth, the mayor put uh, $6.5 million in the budget. And I, I'm proposing, I have had the amendment written here, that we take uh, three and a half million dollars out of uh, a line in the YRS, and that gives us a, a total amount of money to be spent, be ten million dollars. That's what the advocates have talked about. That's what all of us have talked about. And in, 19, in 2014, Mr. Chairman, we shouldn't have these young people out on the street, no place to go. It's hard growing up in the first place. But most of these young people, their families are headed by female heads of household. And I certainly admire those black women for doing that. But it's tough, Mr. Chairman, raising children. Def and I had Christopher, and we had all the means and had the money to buy this and buy that. We had the connecting power to, to get him into out of bounds schools, got him at Merch, got him at Jefferson, got him at Wilson. He graduated in 1998 from Wilson. But what about those people who just don't have those kind of connections? And so I intend to uh, support very strongly your initial cut from DYRS to go to the, to go into the budget, and this additional one. Let me talk a little bit about DYRS. First of all, Mr. Chairman, you would be commended for just keeping the, the pressure on, because these are some of the most troubled youth uh, in the city uh, in America. They come from abusive homes in some instances, dysfunctional families in some instances, uh, victims of violence in some instances. They, you know, they, 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 they probably are the most enduring people, but they've suffered the most stresses on them. Those of us who are not in that kind of situation don't understand that. We, we don't know what it's like. At least I know what it's like, but most of us don't know what it's like to see your friends shot down on the street. See your cousin shot down. See your brother shot down. That is traumatic. I mean, death is traumatic anyway. Under any circumstances, death is traumatic. But then add to it these young minds, have them see that, walk out of the door, they see drug dealing on the corner down there. Mr. Chairman, you know this is true. There are some black boys in low-income communities who has never, ever seen a black man get up and go to work on time. They very rarely have seen their mothers get up and go because there are no requirements until now that you get up and try to find a job. And so uh, we just have to keep working on that aspect of it. Also, there's no coordination as much as it should be between the public schools, some of the education committee, and CSFA, uh, DYRES, and other child-serving uh, places. And so uh, what I intend to do is to work with the, the budget office and work with you on getting this $3.5 million certified to go into our homeless youth. It's a crying shame that in 2014, we have young people have no place to live. Their couch surface, living from place to place, place to place. Just yesterday, I was in the community market in Ward 8 at Mellon and Martin Luther King. And 
these, these two or three guys hanging around in there, asking me for a dollar, asking me for five dollars. I said, well, why aren't you all in school this time of, time of day? Well, first of all, we don't have any way to get to school. Hmm? I know. I, well, we got plenty of time. Where are we going? <laughs> Mr. Graham. <laughs> this, this is just the first Okay, I will. <laughs> I will say some other things to that. Yes. Mr. Barry has moved an amendment. Can we circulate the amendment, please? And the purpose of this amendment, correct me if I'm wrong, is to take $3,500,000 from DYRS Youth and Family Programs to further uh, uh, fund the Homeless Youth Services Act, uh, which is, has $1 million in the proposal before us today, but this would increase it to $4.5 million for the implementation of this, of this law. Um, is there discussion on the amendment? I, you know, I think we need to yeah. we need to work on this, and and I'm I'm willing to accept this provisionally today, with the understanding that we have to work with the our council budget office and with the chief financial officer to see how much of this can be certified. But I think it's well intentioned, and it's worthy of acceptance. But I just don't think we can fully accepted today, so if it's possible to accept it on a conditional basis, I'm willing to do that. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. uh, Mr. McDuffie. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I want to thank Councilmember Barry for this very thoughtful amendment. I, um, I appreciate you accepting it provisionally, but I would be interested to see if there's any initial uh, comments that the, uh, uh, the budget office would have on this, just for the sake of um, Getting some insights at this point. Ms. Brudolph, is there, is there a comment from the Council's Budget Office on this matter? Sure. Um, first off, I'd be very happy to work with the committee, Mr. Barry, Mr. Graham, everyone to uh, figure out whether or not this can be certified. The proposed $3.5 million cut is from the Youth and Family Programs line item in DYRS, which does have a budget of $92.5 million. Uh, but, you know, it's spent on things like, you know, behavioral health, medical, residential services, new beginnings, residential treatment centers, DC Youth Link, case services, so on and so forth. So in order to, you know, really figure out if this cut can be absorbed by DYRS, we would need to go in, um, figure out which service and activities we would like to take this $3.5 million from and what um, services may need to be adjusted or cut in order to, um, in order to effectuate the cut. Uh, when we look at the DYRS actuals as of about a month ago, in, this, in the youth and family programs, they've spent um, about 60% of their budget um, and so they're pretty much on track for spending their entire budget in FY14, which makes me think that there isn't that much fat there. So we would really have to take a look at the line items and the programs, figure out what we would want to reduce, and then work with the CFO in order to um, figure it out. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Do oh, you wish to reclaim your time, Mr. McDuffie? No, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, sir. Mr. Wells? Yeah, I would need to know, know more as well because my fear is, is that we're talking about exactly the same youth that we serve with this, these funds. And the good news is, is that I think we have fewer youth coming into the court system than we've had in years. There's a tremendous amount of progress that's being made at DYRS, and Mr. Graham, you already took $3 million out of the mayor's budget for DYRS for, um, you know, for other purposes. This would be obviously another three to three and a half million. Again, my fear is, is that a lot of these services are services to youth in the community, and these are the youth that also become homeless. And I also know that we've got two lead agencies out there, two or three lead agencies out there. Three? 
two, two lead agencies that are to work with youth back into the community at risk. If, if they're cut, then it actually could have the impact of having more homeless youth. I mean, so I, I would need to, to understand better in Ms. Budoff's um, discussion about whether they spend their full amount, and if they're on track to spend their full amount, then that means we would actually be cutting services, and I'd like to know what would be, what would be cut. So that, that's why um, I agree with you, Mr. Graham. I'm not fully prepared for this because I think that, again, it's, um, it may be cutting services to the same youth that we're trying to serve. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Barry? Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Wells in terms of making sure we're not cutting that which we want to fund. The problem is that we've been up against the pressure of finding money for the homeless youth. And I had scheduled a meeting the day before yesterday with Neil Stanley just to go over this, because I'm not the kind of person that wants to just really need cut and not knowing the consequences of what it is. Uh, he's supposed to come at 2. He thought he's supposed to come at 1. So at 2 o'clock, uh, I was told that he, he'd been ordered not to come. And I don't get into back and forth who ordered. I know who ordered, but I'm not going to say that. And so therefore, and I think I have some information uh, from uh, Ms. Jackson's office so I, I'm, I think we all work together. Mr. Wells, it does not necessarily have to come from that line if it's not feasible. But there, I'm sure in a $109 million budget, you can find something. DYRS had 1,000 young people two, weeks, two years ago. <coughs> Same level of budget. Today, thanks to the hard work of this committee and, and Neil Stanley, we're down to 500 people. So uh, I can count. It amazes me that if you, if you got half the population and don't have any cut in the budget, something's wrong here. Something is wrong. And so, but we, Ms. Rudolph, we work, Ms. Wells, all of us can work together. Because uh, we don't want money being sent back that we know needs to be spent. And you're right, Mr. Well, it may be there are some of the same people. So I'm very careful about that. I'm very careful about that. I don't just with the hatchet jaw. I try to cut surgically so we know what we're doing. But I'm really disturbed. And the mayor, I think, straightened it out. I'm really disturbed at the deputy mayor of Terror seems to be ordering. I don't know for a fact who ordered it. But she seems to be the one that ordered uh, Mr. Stanley not to come. And I tried all afternoon, they were yesterday, to reach her. And she's always busy. I think it's outrageous that a deputy mayor won't find the time to discuss with a council member whose committee he's on to do something. I finally talked with the mayor about it they were yesterday. He assured me that going forward, we'll have the information. I probably have some of it now, but not. Uh, I'm not sure what it says. And I want to thank Ms. Jackson. She worked hard on trying to get this going together. See, my philosophy is that in a democratic system, there ought to be room to disagree programmatically. Why have a council and a mayor if you can't disagree on certain programs? or agree on other programs. And so, Mr. Wells, I, I'd like to ask you, Tommy, to uh, work with us. Tommy, I'd like for you to work with us on trying to identify this money. And if it's not there, I certainly won't propose it. But what I would prefer is that obviously the concerns have been brought up in the committee, and I'm deferring to the chair here, that we not vote on this but that we um, do the work that we need to do to see if it can be certified and that we, you know, to be reflected in the work between now and, mar and either markup or to the committee. Well, we're in markup.
When I vote provisionally, that's what he said. I don't know what provision is. There's no legal. Um, the, it, there's, I don't. Mr. Graham may want to provision elaborate. Means I don't know what provision means. Provisional means. prior to certification. Provision means that it has to be certified in order for it to go into effect. That's what it means. Mr. Graham. Well, I, I do want to note, and, and the numbers here are compelling, and if I may share them with you. In FY12, there were 860, 800, 836 youthful offenders in the DYRS system. On April the 15th, 2013, there were 602, and today there are 550. So we've gone from 836 in 12 to 550 today. That is excellent news for the people of the District of Columbia. But it ought to have some impact on the budget. I just don't know what <coughs> we're going to lose if we if we take this money. And there are things that, for example, I wouldn't want any any. Imp we're just we have a fledgling uh, substance abuse program at DYRS. I don't want that touched. Others may have other things that they don't want touched. We need to work through this. But why don't we pending certification? I'm willing to support this today, so that because there's a crisis of youth homelessness. In the District of Columbia, and we're talking about a dearth. A dearth means there. hardly anything in terms of services. And we have an act that we're about to include in the BSA, I hope, <clears throat> and uh, and so this will help fund it. I think it's a, I think it's an important step. And if we find out that we don't want to go forward with it, we have uh, you know we know you know this year we have two votes on the Request Act. Did you know? We used to have just one vote. But this year there's a first vote, and am I right? First vote, and oh, there's just one vote. We've gone back to one vote. Oh, because there was proposed that we have two votes. What? Oh, that's what the council believes. What the mayor believes is only one vote. Well, that's an interesting set of beliefs. Well, in this case, uh, I'm willing to defer to the chair's leadership. Yeah, on let's this. let's let's take it. It has to be certified. You know, we're going to work with the budget office. We'll work with you, Mr. Wells. I do know that you have already pulled three million out. Yes. Yes, I know. That's, okay. That's what. Mr. Chairman. That also is pending certification. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, could I have a word on this matter? Absolutely. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I'm really where you are, and I wanted to indicate that that we need to look closer at this and work with the budget office but it does um, if we we all believe that numbers speak and uh, if numbers speak it does stand to reason that if the caseload has gone down then the budget may be decreasing unless of course the budget is designed to um, move the young people out of the confinement arena and into the community in some special way so that they're giving an opportunity to become solid citizens. But we don't know that until we really go through the budget line for line. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to look at who are the young people, not by name, but by number um, that are involved in um, youth rehabilitation services and match them to the other services that they may need in the community so that we have a clear understanding as to how our monies are being spent and whether or not there is duplication of services. So I support you, Chairman, and um, I'm ready to vote when you're ready to vote. Mr. Chair. Councilmember McDuffie. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to just to make sure that I'm clear, and, and I understand that your your um, your goal here with this amendment is to accept it provisionally, uh, and the goal again is to work with the budget office uh, to make sure this gets certified. Uh, I guess I just want to raise another concern. In addition to the concern that's already been raised uh, by Council Member uh, Wells, which is the three million dollars from DRS that you intend to go to DHS which as I understand it still has to be certified as well. So the 3.5 million in this amendment is on top of the initial 3 million and it also will have to be certified. All right, so, so to the extent that happens, then, then obviously I'm supportive of it. I just wanna note though, I, I do have concerns about um, where the money comes from. 
and the potential impact it has on staffing ratios at DYRS, particularly as it relates to the Jerry M. consent decree. I would not want to do anything to jeopardize what uh, is a court-ordered uh, decree that requires certain staffing ratios in the event that there is a spike. I do appreciate the numbers that you laid out, and it's very encouraging that there's been such a drastic uh, decrease uh, in youth uh, over DRS, and, and I hope that trend continues. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that, that it's clear on the record that uh, there's some things that are beyond our control that we have to make sure that we don't jeopardize uh, as we contemplate uh, this amendment and what we do with this budget. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Council Chairman. Member. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. All Chairman, those in I, I finish yet. Well, we're ready to vote. I, I am. I'm ready to vote after I make. Probably would be willing to take yes as an answer. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, and for other members of the committee, let me just be very clear. I tried desperately to get Mr. Stanley over to my office to sit with Mr. Rand and myself, to go line by line, what has been spent, what's proposed to be spent, and do it surgically. But he was ordered, and I see that it appears by Deputy Mayor Terrell, not to come. I was insulted that a council member can't have a discussion and talk with the mayor. And the mayor made a point. He's instructed all of his department heads not to be making deals. I agree with that. But how else are we going to act, Mr. McDuffie, if they, if we don't have the, the information? Well, we did this historically, so I'm open. I want to work, Mr. Graham. We work together. Um, get in the budget office and look at all these. If, if it's in some other place in DYRS, that's fine. But I have a serious problem with having cut. The population down to 500, which is commendable, and have the same size budget. That defies logic to me. So uh, we'll work on it. I'm ready to vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Barry. Mr. So Chair, the, right before we, uh, if, if I could, Mr. just McCuffey. briefly, it, would it not be uh, perhaps more prudent to to hold off on this until we've had an opportunity to have this conversation next week uh, when we meet and maybe do this? at a later date uh, as opposed to moving forward with it before it's certified by the CFO's office, um, particularly given that we still have uh, what you intend to do with the initial $3 million that, that's still a question that, that, that lingers at this point. I don't know how wise it would be for us to, to, to do that at this point. It would be my preference um, to hold off on this. Well, I, I really appreciate that point of view, but I think we already have the $3 million which is subject to certification. And this, quite frankly, was the conversation I had last night with the CFO, because the CFO's office is asking for, quote, further justification. And as I said to the CFO, I'm not willing to provide justification. That's a decision for this panel to make whether a transfer is justified or not. And I said to the CFO, if you have other issues, let's consider them. And he agreed. He said, we, it's not our business to examine your justification. Like, that's the exact word that was used. And so we're having a little bit of a back and forth here. But I'm, I'm now confident that we're going to be entering into this discussion with the support of the CFO, because he doesn't think it's the business of his office to examine justifications for transfers. Uh, that is, uh, that's our business. And so, uh, with all due respect to Mr. McDuffie, I think this joins another $3 million, and so we can have $6.5 million to consider uh, as to whether or not the CFO will certify it. But I don't want them certifying it on the basis of whether there's a justification or not. You understand what I'm saying, Ms. Budoff? Yes. Did you have a comment on that? You don't have to make a comment. You just had a look on your face that said, let me comment. Am I reading too much into your face? No. No, okay. no comment. All right. So uh, let's, let's put it on the table. Because I know how much you care about youth homelessness, Mr. McDuffie. And I do, too. And all of us do. And if the money is needed at, at uh, DYRS, we'll hear from DYRS. They'll make the case. If not, let's, let's, let's fund this uh, youth homelessness uh, legislation that we all support. 
There being for, no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Then we report this, uh, this amendment is adopted by unanimous consent, subject to the, uh, sub subject to the discussion that we've had on it. Uh, we now proceed to, oh no, we now proceed to the main motion on the Budget Request Act, the budget, that is, of the Human Services Committee. Is there further discussion on the budget? Mr. Wells. Mr. Graham, I don't want to take too much time, but I just want to say that, that your responsibility in this committee oversight is the hardest job on the City Council. And when you take this budget and you look at the conversation we just had, do we take money from these youth in need to those youth in need is the metaphor and the example of what you have to do with this budget. It is, again, one of the hardest, it is the hardest responsibility on the City Council. And I know because I've done it. And you have done it, and you and your staff particularly Ms. Barlow, have crafted a budget as best that which you work with. You've moved some priorities around, and during your oversight, the numbers have gotten so much better for young people that are in the child welfare system, so much better for youth that are in the juvenile justice system, that there's been marked improvement among youth since your oversight of this committee. And additionally, there's been other problems that you've had to shift priorities to homelessness for young families, and now homeless for youth. And so I just want to acknowledge and commend what you are doing, what you've done on behalf of the District of Columbia, of our residents, and that um, and how we are all so appreciative that you have accepted and you have delivered on this responsibility. And thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Well, uh, Mr. McDuffie, do you have a comment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to echo um, uh, Councilmember Wells' comments about uh, your efforts on this budget and the efforts of your staff, who I think also uh, are to be commended uh, for their work. I also want to just recognize uh, and thank you for working with other committees, uh, including mine, on uh, hiring, having the funds in this budget to hire 10 caseworkers at D.C. General. Uh, you know, as, as I have the uh, chairmanship of the Committee on Government Operations with Department of General Services. We worked together on issues around D.C. General. We had a conversation as recent as a couple of days ago about D.C. General uh, and wanted to applaud you for your efforts. And uh, so long as I'm the chair and, and on, this, on this body, I'm going to work with you and others uh, to try to address the systemic issues that we have there at D.C. General. So, so I want to thank you and your staff for your work on that uh, and that. on this budget as a whole. So thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Bonds. Yes, thank you, um, Chairman. I haven't had the privilege of working with you but for a few months, but um, I, I feel your heart. I think the community feels your heart, and I know that the mayor feels your heart. Um, it's a very tough job that you've had over these months to um, balance things and make sure that those who are the least amongst us um, have the kind of guidance that will help them go on and have a full productive life and you are really to be commended for that and I mean that sincerely. Um, also I know that these are tough decisions, very tough decisions, but I applaud you whenever I hear that you are able to identify monies that are not spent and move them to a category that need where there is a need to be spent. And so I think that's what I've seen you do um, over, in fact, over the years, um, watching the council over the last 15 years. So um, thank you very, very much. And it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to be here with you and to understand, the, as I say, the dynamics of this um, council um, as people are increasingly going into the category of needing assistance. Um, just the other day we read that the percentage of increase in homelessness is um, 3% and going up. We already know that there's an increase in those who are trapped in poverty, so we have to do everything that we can to assist um, 
as much as we can with the resources that we have. And so I say to the, the city, you know, bring on the cranes, bring in the new people who um, have resources and who are going to pay um, taxes and spend, 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 um, so that we can help those who are trapped at the bottom and make a difference in their lives as well. Everyone who is in the District of Columbia should have the opportunity to have a good life, a better life. And so I see this committee very committed to um, that equation. And thank you very, very much, uh, Council Member Graham. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Member Bonds. Council Member Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have worked very closely with you since I've been on the committee. Your philosophy is almost exactly my philosophy, that you have to take care of those who need help the most. You have to be a voice for those who have lost their voice, and to be hope for those who have lost hope. And you have a population that is influenced by poverty. They are a third of our population, a third, are living at or below the poverty line. 200,000 people in Medicaid. 200,000. 200,000. We're spending $2 billion on health care. My view about all of this, and I've said this to some business people, why don't you hire some people, cut down on the social costs? It's been clear that in the third grade, they got some kind of instrument that began to gauge whether or not you end up in the criminal justice system, Tommy. And so you've done superb in that. I told you privately and personally and publicly, I'm going to miss you. And you're not disappearing, but as chair of the committee, uh, I'm going to miss you because you provided great leadership against a lot of push against you on that. But fortunately, you've had a good committee. We have a different opinion from time to time. But uh, we all have the same goals. How do we get people out of poverty? How do we get people self-sufficient? How do we let them become part of, of, of the moderate to middle income, own their homes, send their kids to college? The same thing that all Americans Want to, want to do. And one found specific thing as a race at TANF. As you know, I supported the mayor for mayor, but I gave him an agenda. I gave him a list of things I wanted him to support. And one of them was TANF CPIs. We hadn't had that since, I think, 19. When was the last time we had CPI? Yeah. We hadn't had a CPI change since 1996. The cost of keeping, cost of increase is gone. So fortunately, the mayor put in for this year a cost of living increase. The same thing for next year. In 17, he's proposing a 41% increase in TANF payments. Uh, I've been trying to figure out how to raise that payment level. Uh, it's tied to food stamps. I've talked with the Under Secretary of Agriculture. So all this fits in together. Let's get our people out of poverty. Those who are born in their poverty, it's not their fault. God decides when you're born, how you're born, where you're born, what color you're born. So these least among us are not responsible for their plight. Now, many of them are responsible for what they do once they get here, but not because they were born into poverty. The way you get children out of poverty is get their parents out of poverty. That's how it goes. And so we got our work still ahead of us uh, because the budget is not the only thing that we work on. We work on trying to increase coordination between these various agencies. Uh, we truancy is involved here. Dropout rates involved. All of this is involved. And so I want to thank you for your leadership. Uh, and not just, not just started this year, 
The leadership has been there for a long time. And when I met you, I think you were at Women Walker, uh, when the HIV AIDS virus was sort of a no-no that the people shouldn't be messing with that. It was considered then a uh, white gay men man, disease, the virus. We know it better. It hits all stripes, all kinds of people, all kinds of lifestyles. Now, there are some lifestyles that you're more prone to get it, but you were there working in the vineyard. I remember the, the marches you had on the mall and the other kind of things I, I came to. And I consider you a, a friend, a very dear friend, not just a political friend, but a, just a personal friend. Uh, you voted with me on a num number of things when it was difficult to vote, when it wasn't popular to vote, when we didn't have the votes, but you voted anyway. And so I really appreciate your leadership. Uh, we're going to continue to work until the end of this year. I appreciate your approach to homelessness in the sense of putting a bill out there where we have major hearings, major debates on that. Because we, all of us deplore the horrible conditions at D.C. General. Some of these hotels are not up to snuff. I faced the same problem when I came in as mayor. We had 700 families living in Capital City Motel and some other. And it took me a little while. We finally closed it, just closed it. The way we closed it, the, determine, the mayor determines we're going to close it. And so I'm very optimistic that Mayor Gray with his 500 families in 100 years be successful. He has all of our support in doing that. I represent the poorest ward in the city. Poverty is high in more than in other places. Unemployment is higher. We have more tenant workers than anybody in plants than anywhere else. And so I want to thank you. Uh, it's not over. It's not over till the fat lady sings. And the fat lady hasn't sang yet. So we'll be here for a while. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Golly, I don't know. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> this is a great committee. This is a committee with a heart, and in a city with a heart. <clears throat> and uh, we're about to vote. Excuse me, I'm choked up. <clears throat> thank you, Marion. Thank you. Uh, and we're about to vote on the on the committee on the budgets within the committee, which total I think pretty much a billion dollars. The uh, uh, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of responsibility. I, I'm, I'm reminded of something that Helen Keller said, which is that it's very difficult getting those who have everything to care about those who have nothing. And as we vote on this, which I think will probably be a unanimous vote, that gives us five votes going into the council. We need two more votes to hold on to this budget, which I think is right thinking. And I just hope that all of you, as you're about to vote, see this as a commitment to the council deliberation, because uh, we, you know, we've got to meet with a lot of other. We've got to contend with a lot of other priorities that have, have real uh, substance to them. But so I'm counting on all of you as you vote. So uh, we're now voting on the budgets before the committee of human services. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. May I report a unanimous vote of the committee? I'm reporting a unanimous vote of the committee. Thank you all very much. And now we proceed to the Budget uh, Support Act. Let me say before, before entering into that full discussion, it's going to take us a little time on this, is that I want to uh, very much acknowledge um, the advocates who have been involved in this budget. I mean, I, I have loved advocates ever since I was an advocate. <laughs> but I've appreciated advocacy from the nonprofit sector very, very deeply. And, I, and, and, and my experience here as a council member has reinforced all of that. We could not do what we do without your intelligence, without your expertise, without your, you know, toughness. And, and just recently I experienced that again, and we have so I've had some vigorous conversations, but we come out of it for the better, and I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank my staff uh, before proceeding with the Budget Support Act, K.J. Bachi, uh, Myla Moss, 
Laura Flagel, Malcolm Cameron, and this lady to my left. Now you'll see her head drop. Do you see her head dropping? This is Yolanda Barlow. And Yolanda, uh, Barlow, Ms. Barlow, I'm going to call you now for the purposes of this commendation. You've already been commended by Mr. Wells, and he should have commended you because he brought you along, and, and you were part of the, the legacy that you left for me, Mr. Wells. And there was a lot of legacy, but uh, Ms. Barlow was one of them. And she has done, I, I, you, you just can't appreciate how important the staff are on this council until you're dealing with all of the complexities of a budget of this size and you have done a superb job. And I mean that from my heart and also from my brain. And we, I congratulate all of the staff. But This is my legislative director, and she's done a heck of a job. Thank you all very much. Now, as some of you know, I have been talking about closing D.C. General Family Shelter. When I watched Channel 5 Fox News the other night, and I saw these little children wandering around at 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, and then I saw one person, a woman, appear to punch a toddler who then fell to the sidewalk. It just reached right into my heart when I saw that. And I thought, what does that represent for us as a city? You know, how could we be creating an institution such as this with special responsibilities, which we must have? I don't want to hear nobody say that because it's, you know, people are on welfare, because they're homeless that we don't have important th responsibilities. How can we be tolerating such a situation where a TV camera would capture a toddler being punched to the ground by someone? And I hope somebody somewhere is investigating this. I have already brought this to the attention of uh, the community partnership. But we have the mayor's ambitious plan to move 500 families out of the hotels, homeless families out of hotels and out of DC general. Uh, now by July the 15th. I say Godspeed Mayor Gray, because this is an important thing that he's doing, and we've got to support it vigorously. And if he's successful, then we'll be left with approximately 100 to 150 families at DC General and, and by the end of this fiscal year. That gives us the ability to, for the first time, to really say, we want to shut this thing down. But we don't want to shut it down and put people back in stairwells or bus stations or, or hallways or going from aunt so-and-so aunt to aunt so-and-so. We want to shut it down with people moving to quality housing suitable for families. And I think we can do it. I think we can do it. There will be savings from shutting down D.C. General. There will be other savings. Uh, this city has a billion dollars plus, minus, a billion dollars in our savings account, I think we're okay. I don't think the city is running into tremorous times where our budget is in, in challenge. we got plenty of money. We're flush with cash. And if we can't deal with these, the most unfortunate, the most vulnerable families in the District of Columbia, then I think we have a problem. So I'm hoping, so I was hoping to do all of this, but the stakeholders came to me and they said, Jim, you don't want to do this without first engaging with the families at D.C. General. And I said, you're right. We don't want to do this. We don't want this an edict coming from on high that we're going to do this for you. And so instead of having in the Budget Support Act, I have moved this matter to the um, separate legislation which we are now drafting, which I will introduce hopefully with the support of all my committee colleagues. I've spoken to each of you about this. And then we'll hold hearings, maybe a hearing here, hearing here, that doesn't, a hearing at the Wilson Building, a hearing at D.C. General, so that everybody feels involved in this, and so that people realize that this is not an empty promise. We are determined to provide quality housing for homeless family, because as I said over and over again, we can pay the piper now, <coughs> but that little toddler <coughs> who was punched to the ground, we can pay the piper now and create a good life and a good child development experience for that toddler, or we can pay it later on. But we're going to pay the piper for these children who aren't being raised correctly. And so I think we just have a, a moral imperative to do this. And I hope that uh, people have talked about my tenure here. I hope that we'll have made major progress with this and also the CCNV shelter before the end of this year. So now we proceed to the Budget Support Act. We have Title II, Subtitle I, which is the local rent supplement. 
sustainment. Um, this is, by the way, I have to say a commercial message that I was the original author of this act. This proposed subtitle from the mayor expands the discretion and independence of DHS to fill all new and vacated local rent supplement program vouchers. The current law requires the slots be filled according to priority and referral system established in district regulations. This amendment would remove the priority classification and allow DHS to have full discretion in determining the system for filling slots. In the circulated draft of the committee report, there is a tentative recommendation to support this. But after conversations with Councilmember Bowser and members of the advocacy community, there really are concerns about this language. And we want time to reflect on all of this, so it is my recommendation, it is my recommendation that we disapprove this title for present purposes. Is there a discussion? 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 Discussion, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barry? You know, you and I have talked about an approach None of us, including Mayor Gray and others on this council, don't disagree on the end. We have some differences of how you get there. And I, I support your efforts to have separate legislation because what happens, rumors start spreading. You told me you were at D.C. Family Center and the families were all nervous and upset. And so this will allow broad participation and would also allow those who have not been involved with the problem to step forward, like the business community, the apartment owners, and others who have housing and refuse to rent to low-income people. So this is a great approach, and so you can count on my vote on this. You can count on me being at the hearing. As I, as I am with most hearings. And I would urge you to make sure all of us are engaged. It's not just your problem or mine or Ms. Bonds. It's all of our problem. It's all of our responsibility. And so this is a wonderful approach. It cuts down the confrontation or kind of thing that goes on time to time. And then homelessness is a major problem, a job. It's tough because the homeless population have a number of underlying issues, violence underlying issues. Some of them have emotional problems. Some families have been victims of, of uh, family abuse by men in their, in their lives. They had all kinds of things going on. So at least this committee can give people a sense of hope, a sense of ending this cycle of dependency, a sense that we care. You know, I, I, I had a friend of mine one time said, it's better to show that you care than say you care. And I want us to show, want us to show that we care. The, the persons we're serving don't have many voices. This council committee has to be the voice. This council committee has to take responsibility. I intend to start visiting a number of shelters myself. We need a comprehensive approach. We need to figure out how we have four or five smaller CCNVs. To have 13, 14 people packed over there is ridiculous. But it's all they got right now. We have through at 301 East uh, Drive in St. Elizabeth. We have 300 people over there. And it pains me, Mr. Chairman, if, if I, and I do often, if I ride down Martin Luther King Avenue around 7.15, 7.30, you see guys sitting in benches. They've been put out of the shelter at 7 o'clock. That's inhumane. I want us to get to the point where we get the underlying reason of poverty, the underlying reasons of why you are homeless. It's a massive problem. But I've learned if it's massive, it takes massive work. It takes commitment and dedication. So you can count on Marion Barry. I've been there a lot since I've been in this city. I'm going to resolve myself to do more 
My health is, is improving greatly. I'm about 90% back. And my mind just is sharp as it, it has been. But thank you, Jim, for this approach. This is a great approach. And uh, I discussed this situation with the mayor, named Paul Ass. And he had heard through the grapevine that you were going to introduce a, a amendment to the BSA requiring that the shelter be closed by December 31st. I told him, I said, Jim Graham is a reasonable person. He would not do anything to jeopardize those families at D.C. General. And your approach uh, does that. We need to get the city government put more money in here. We spend money on everything except that which we ought to spend it on in terms of homelessness, poverty, job training, etc. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to turn this into a love fest, but I do want to say this, that there is no <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the love fest, actually, but, you know, I, I like them when they occur. But there's no individual in the District of Columbia who has contributed more to human welfare and dignity than you have, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Marion Barry, Jr. And, and it, it just, for me, that, that statement sums it up. I, I, I just can't begin to describe in any kind of detail the impact you've had on people's lives and the quality of people's lives in the District of Columbia. So, but we have to move on with the business that before us. So I'm going to move to disapprove this subtitle two, subtitle one, which you will recall relates to the issues of DHS and the local rent supplement program. Uh, is there discussion? Is there discussion here? None. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. I'm going to report a unanimous vote of disapproval on that. We now move to Title V, Subtitle A, which is the DDS management reform. This particular amendment clarifies the authority of the Department of Disability Services to work with the Department of Healthcare Finance in order to better serve individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families by improving the design of existing policies and utilizing the agreement between the two agencies to positively influence rate setting for services. Um, there are a number of, uh, this amendment is before you. I'm not going to, uh, I, I do want to say the committee supports, I support the proposed subtitle. Uh, we have presented several technical and conforming changes. Uh, we have also added several provisions to provide for the structure of the Family Support Advisory Council. And, uh, and so I'm going to proceed without separate votes on all these amendments and have a, a general vote at the end because there's a number of these. Uh, and if you, if anybody wants to go back to a specific uh, amendment, we can do so. The next one is the uh, subtitle on 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 uh, Title Five, Subtitle F, proposed by the mayor, which would increase the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program Heat and Eat Initiative benefit from one dollar to twenty dollars. The increase will ensure that supplemental assistance nutrition participants who are eligible to receive higher benefits. Uh, if they receive emergency assistance, continue to receive the higher SNAP benefit level. This is food stamps. So this is an increase in the food stamps. And uh, we support this uh, amendment, and I hope that uh, the committee will support it. The next one is um, Title V, Subtitle H, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, Cost of Living Adjustment. This is a bill that uh, Councilmember Barry introduced. I was pleased to join with him as a co-introducer. And this, this provides um, a cost of living adjustment. And this committee report reflects the mayor's proposal that that be funded for TANF recipients. It's long overdue. We haven't had a, a cost of living a, adjustment for TANF recipients for a number of years. And this will help them make ends meet. Uh, so uh, the committee has provided some technical and conforming language. Uh, now, I'm going to continue through the whole thing, okay? Uh, now, we have new BSA subtitles that we are presenting. One is the CCMV Feasibility and Assessment Study Act of 2014. I introduced emergency and temporary legislation establishing the CCMV Task Force back in 2013. This council approved that measure. We've had a number of meetings of the task force. And we need to have a better understanding of some of the housing and space needs 
at CCNV and connecting facilities. Uh, we need that analysis. And we have run, we're running out of time, so I think we would now be benefited by professional assistance, that is paid assistance, to help us go through those issues. Uh, the recommendations of the CCNV task force will be before us soon. This is the largest shelter in the District of Columbia, folks. This is 1,300 people a night in one location. Mitch Snyder, this is the great legacy for Mitch Snyder and all of his work for homeless individuals, single adults. So we consider and address the need for a new facility to replace the uh, current building and a number of other areas. So this $550,000 will move this along and keep the momentum going. We also have the End Youth Homelessness Amendment Act of 2014. This is a new BSA subtitle which we are proposing to be include. Uh, the Alliance of Youth Advocates, one of our DCAYA, released a bold strategy back in October to end youth homelessness in the District of Columbia. Uh, and we, they called for a new commitment to end, end this form of homelessness. Uh, the plan, which was developed by several area nonprofits, provided the conceptual basis for Bill 20 735, which was introduced by myself and Council Members Che and McDuffie. Thank you very much. Uh, the subtitle incorporates several provisions in the bill. Specifically, it requires that all district residents, including unaccompanied minors who are homeless and cannot access other housing arrangements, are entitled to shelter in severe winter months. It's a very important declaration. It depends, it describes how member agencies will coordinate to provide hypothermia shelter. It requires coordination between DHS and the Interagency Council on Homelessness to conduct a really bona fide youth census to determine the actual point in time survey, or separate from the annual point in time survey, to determine the needed scale and scope of a comprehensive program to address these issues. Requires funding to support a minimum of 45 additional shelter beds for homeless youth. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, I authored, uh, I worked on legislation that was authored by Council Member Che to provide 10 additional beds for LGBTQ youth and but when we went through that process, that passed, and so that's good because there's special needs there. When we went through that process, we determined we want to do this for every youth in the District of Columbia, and so that's what this is all about. Each age is 18 uh, and younger, and to, but to 24. So uh, let's see. I want to also discuss what has been a concern long expressed regarding the shelter of unaccompanied minors. Based on information I've received from the advocates who have worked with the committee on this legislation, I made a change from the circulated reports. Strike section C2, page 77, that gives unaccompanied minors the right to shelter, adding new language that would require the district's winter plans developed by the ICH to include a protocol for addressing the shelter needs of homeless unaccompanied minors. I believe this change will address some of the agency's concerns while also ensuring that youth are protected during the winter. The committee has been able to identify and certify $1 million to recurring funding to partially support the provisions of this legislation. And we're currently working to have it certified. And of course, as we all know, Council Member Barry has added an additional $3.5 million to that. Uh, the, the next uh, Budget Support Act amendment is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Reduction Amendment Act. We have just gone through a family homelessness crisis which was not anticipated by the Interagency Council on Homelessness or anyone else. And here we were in February with tenfold demand for family shelter. But we, at the same time, we're planning by law to cut TANF benefits on October the 1st, 2014 by 42% for families that have been in TANF for more than 60 months. This amendment that I propose today requires that there will be no TANF benefits were provided will be the subject of cuts on October the 1st. The committee has been able to certify the necessary funds to stop the cut in FY 2015 by shifting resources from the TANF employment program, which I, the mayor is proposing a TANF employment program budget of $40 million for FY15 compared to $18 million today. And so I think this can be sustained. The committee has long expressed concerns, subsequently opposed and led successful efforts to delay the previously scheduled reductions to TANF. Everybody wants people to move from welfare dependency to self-sufficiency. Everybody wants that. But we've got to have programs in place to ensure that that can happen. We've got to do it. 
And our programs are better and better, but the fact of the matter is they're not ready to really do this. And I think also of the 11,000 children, Mr. Barry's already made reference to this, 11,000 children under the age of 13 who I believe who will be subject to these cuts, who I believe will be the real victims of what's going to happen. Because they will be the ones that will lose out by 42% cut in TANF benefits affecting their parent. The committee recognizes that imposing super cuts into already poverty-stricken households will only achieve the goal of de per per perpetuating poverty, the effects of which have been well documented. And the effects of poverty on child development are, are fully understood at this point. With a total local funding of $29 million and a federal allocation totaling $10 million, the TANF employment program, as I mentioned, has a $40 million proposed budget for FY15. Well, the committee has supported and has encouraged agency efforts to redesign that program. There are concerns, as I mentioned, about the effectiveness. Uh, as of uh, March 1, 2014, there were a total of 6,200 clients being served by vendors. Of this number, 2,500 were employed with only 1,000 customers in full-time employment. I don't know what the salary. I don't know what salary. And the notion of somebody working at a minimum wage who has to have food stamps in order to survive, I don't think this is what we have in mind. Of the 8,388 customers referred to employment vendors, 4,900 were not engaged at all. So we're not reaching these people. The committee acknowledges that there is progress, but there's still significant barriers to employment experienced by many TANF families. These outcomes raise questions as to how well our vendors as a whole are working to meaningfully connect families, identify their barriers, and assist them in getting jobs. So that leads me to conclude that we don't want a 42% cut of TANF benefits on October the 1st. We also have an amendment, the Power Expansion Amendment Act of 2014. Uh, this would exempt from TANF cuts uh, a single custodial parent or caretaker with a child under 12 months old, a baby in other words, who should not be subject to TANF cuts and should not be subject to the time tolling for TANF for, for the 60 months. Uh, now, now no, no parent may remain eligible under this paragraph for more than 12 months. I have fought for an exemption for this population since I first I introduced the town of time limit bill in 2012. My conviction is that this is the right thing to do for babies. And that is supported zero to th by zero to three, a nationally recognized nonpartisan research and policy organization that studies child development issues. In July 2010, zero to three issued recommendations to the federal government related to children under the age of three. Their number two recommendation was, quote, require states to exempt single parents caring for a child under the age of one from TANF work requirements and time limits. That is time for the parent to be with the baby. It is not the time for a parent to be working about, worrying about cuts on TANF. We have certified, we have had certification for $2.6 million to provide this exemption in FY 2015. It's not reoccurring, but I hope this council in its wisdom will find the monies in the future to continue this. The committee is working with the budget office and the office of the chief financial officer to determine the best way to utilize these funds. We're exploring whether extending the exemption to parents with a child under the age of six months or nine months instead of 12 months would reduce the population enough that the funding we have certified will be adequate, adequate to support the continued reduction, reduction in out years. But again, a city with $1 billion in a savings account, can't we spare babies under the age of 12 months from TANF cuts? I mean. Finally, food stamps. Uh, the, 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 this next subtitle establishes a locally funded minimum food stamp benefit. Under this subtitle, a, food, a family participating in the food stamp program whose federally funded household benefit is less than $30 per month. Did you hear that? Less than $30 per month shall receive locally funded benefits to provide the household's total benefit to a higher amount. I stated earlier I would like to thank Council Member Che for providing $1.3 million to enhance food stamp benefits. Uh, and this uh, money has been certified as reoccurring. I circulated in the report the enhancement is $30. However, we have been told that the $1.3 million may not cover administrative costs, so we're working on the budget to uh, make sure that happens. 
I now move to approve the following new BSA subtitles, as well as all the subtitles discussed earlier in my uh, presentation that have been presented by the mayor. We're, pres we're now moving to consider all of the BSA subtitles. Is there a discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for your thoughtful recommendations. Let me speak to the TANF cuts. I've talked with Mayor Gray about this. And he just has a different philosophy. He wants to achieve the same thing we do. In my view, and I told him this, his approach is punitive. And the category of persons that we have uh, witnessed and supported have had punitive things happen to them all their life. If you want to do this, we're going to do that to you. The police comes around. If you do this, we're going to do that to you. If you've got a substance problem, if you don't do this, we're going to do that. And I think we need another approach. Your approach, my approach, other members' approach, is how do you provide the opportunity for the tenant people? I talked to Deborah Carroll, for instance. I said, why don't we pick 500, 600,000 people on TANF who have their GED, uh, get their GED, let's have four years of career development. They're already getting money for their cash benefits too low. So it means that for four years, you can put people on a career path. There's no career path at Popeye's or Kentucky Fried Chicken. There's no career path, quite frankly, in the security business. You either become the owner, which is rare, or you become a worker. And so I think our approach is more humane. And the mayor is not inhumane. He just has a different approach. I discussed it with him two nights ago that I feel very strongly that you can't keep punishing people, expecting them to react, because they've been punished all their life. And they said, hell with it. I don't want to be bothered with that. The other thing we've got to do is figure out how we motivate them. How we motivate people to take advantage of their opportunities. And uh, part of, I think, what we can do is have some motivational counselors that when they're talking to the, to the recipients, some of the, some of the workers look at the recipients with disdain. They, you know, they ain't nothing, there will be nothing, as opposed to they have the potential of being the best that they can be. So I like that approach, no question about that. And so we rest assured, Mr. Graham, that the next year's budget, if it has a cut in it, which I doubt it will be, I don't think Mr. Bowser approaches it the same way, we're going to fight then to keep that from happening. We're going to revamp all of what we do, give people a sense of hope, motivation, and opportunity. We need to involve the business community a great deal in terms of these jobs. Because the government only has about 40,000 D.C. government jobs, but there are 300,000 jobs in the private sector, 300,000. And 70% of those jobs are held by non-D.C. residents. We need, a, we need a residency requirement for our own workers, so that our, our, our school teachers and police officers and firemen and other mid-level income people can be required to live in the District of Columbia. And finally, I think the last thing you, we, we talked about was the children, the children, the children. You and I discussed this. If you cut the TANF benefits, unfortunately, most of these parents are not going to take it out of their money they spend. They're going to take it out of their children's money. Then you're going to have children who are already underserved, going to school, raggedy, hungry, no hope. Now, one thing I, I want to point out to this committee, I'm on education. The chancellor is going to initiate 
a program to try to keep black boys out of this system of going to jail, etc. And uh, she's committed to it. But in Ward 8, 82% of the families are headed by female heads of household. And I applaud those black women. But I know how difficult it is. F and I only have one child, Christopher. We had the means, had the knowledge to get him into Merch, out of boundary, get him into Jefferson, out of boundary, get him into Wilson, where he graduated in 98, out of boundary. But what about those parents that don't have that kind of connection, that don't have that kind of means to do anything? And so you're absolutely right. Can you imagine punishing uh, a one-year-old baby when all this money we got? We spend, let's, let's go down to New York Avenue and see this fleet of white cars down there, a whole fleet of white cars. So we had to spend money on, on our bottom line. I don't agree with that. You don't agree with that. We need to be financially solvent, but we don't need to be spending. We got $1.75 billion in our savings account. And then we got a rainy day fund. It's just a matter of different philosophies between the mayor and us. He knows it. I've talked to him about it. And hopefully, uh, I've talked to Ms. Bowser about this whole problem. And she's committed to reform and to get something done differently. We are committed to it. Uh, I'm working to support her. So, Mr. Chairman, I get kind of choked up a little bit, like you do. When I think about these young people out here with no hope, a little hope, with no direction, a little direction. And so uh, those of us who have a heart, it's hard to take this, you know. But you've done a remarkable job. So I support all the, all the amendments. And I'm sure my colleagues will do the same thing. But uh, these are tough times for poor people. They're catching more hell now than they've caught in a long time. And people who are low income, they watch television, see all these shiny cars and all this fast life and these uh, good times that people are having. They said, what about me? What about me? I'm not responsible for being born in poverty. So the government has a responsibility to create opportunities to permanently solve this problem. If we don't do something differently, we come back next year with the same problem, don't cut TANF, don't do this. We need to look at it for the long term. Like I said, my suggestion is to take 500,000 people and put them on a career path. But then in four years, or even two years, they're in position to be making thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars And I'll give you one example. I have six African-American godchildren. I have four by the same mother. And when I met her some time back, she got pregnant when she was 15. Her mother was old-fashioned and let her go back to school. And she had not even her GED, didn't have anything. But I persuaded her to go for a GED, which she did. Persuaded her to do home health care aid, which she did. And just three months ago, she got her licensed practical nurse certificate. And in May, she's going to enroll in UDC for an RN. Now, that's what I'm talking about in terms of permanent solutions. So she'll go from the little bit of money she makes now to fifty, sixty, seven thousand dollars $7,000. So she will be out of poverty. Her kids will be out of poverty. And that's the kind of thing we need to do. You know, need to do it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And by the way, I did send the Fox 5 video to everybody on the committee and on the council. And if you, if you haven't seen it, please watch it because, you know, your heart will hurt the way my heart hurt. When I saw that little toddler at 1.30 in the morning being punched by a woman and falling to the ground, and I thought, what are we bargaining for in the future? What are we doing? 
And so please look at the video. I think Fox 5 has performed a real public service in, in capturing all of this for the public and in two or three different reports. And so it's a, it was, it's a fine piece of journalism. We're now proceeding to vote on all of the BSA amendments, the new ones, the ones presented by the mayor, everything I've now discussed, except for the first one, which we have already voted to disapprove. So all those in favor, for discussion, for discussion, here and none, all those in favor say aye, aye. Opposed, no. Uh, I'm going to report a unanimous vote of the members present. Please, we've got five votes going into the council. We need two more. Two more. Stay steady. Stay with us. Because keep we the course. Keep, keep the course. What? <laughs> keep the course, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to need two more votes. So to hold steady, this is a right thinking budget that we've now approved, and I like it very much. Now I, I move for approval of the Committee on Human Services FY 2015 committee report with leave for the staff to make technical and conforming changes. Discussion, discussion, hearing none. All those in favor say aye, aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Let the record reflect that the Committee on Human Services FY 2015 budget report is approved. Our final vote uh, on the, we've done that, we've done that, we've done everything, we've done everything except for me to say. Uh, this concludes this meeting of the Committee on Human Services. I want to thank everybody who put their energies into this huge budget that it protects poor people in the District of Columbia. I think we've come out with a better budget than we were presented with. But I, I got to say that Mayor Gray gave us, gave us a very good budget to begin with, but I think we've made it better, and I hope we now have the support of the Mayor of the District of Columbia to make all this into law. Uh, the Mayor's budget, the, the uh, so this hearing on the Mayor's FY 2015 Budget Request Act and the Mayor's Budget Support Act of 2015 is adjourned. The time is 10 minutes after 12 on the same day that we started. Thank you. <laughs>